Unputdownable, Chapter 1 The man waiting in the alley stepped to and fro before a puddle, as though playing a little game with it. The puddle looked rooted to the cracked alley, a natural part of it, a permanent feature. The man was small, rangy, well-dressed. The sheet of his face caught all the light, as though lacking features to cast shadows. He peered into the puddle and then stepped back swiftly from it. A game he probably played as a boy. Grew up on a farm, I jot down. I was in the crystal ball cafe with a mostly clear view down the alley. There was indeed a crystal ball on the wooden counter. I'd gazed into it as my espresso was conjured, saw only my giant eyeball inverting back at me. I sat at the window shelf on a high, hard chair beside a painting of a tarot card, the Palace of Swords, the shelf, table, and possibly even the painting, its multitude of swords dripped with blood, were small punishments, meant to keep you moving along. But I would be staying for a bit, because I was writing my novel. With a very expensive fountain pen, in a very expensive leather-bound journal, on a very small table, on a very high chair, next to far too many bloody swords. I looked exactly like what I was, a rich pretender. I don't mind. That's my look, I suppose. For the last couple of weeks, you could say, I was trying to be a novelist, seeing if I was one, if there was any promising clue that I might become one, given time and effort. I suppose I was hoping to stumble upon a good phrase or two, or fall into the exquisite maelstrom of a well-observed paragraph, or even suddenly find that I'd accidentally, somehow, written a complete novel without even knowing it. Allison assured me she'd tell me if I had what it took or not. She already seemed to know the answer. I had more or less been writing down everything I saw, making a pile of sticks and branches in the creamy white pages of my notebook. Phrases and sentences and descriptions. Things like the little man in the alley, and how he didn't have a face, or the permanent puddle. But there was no story yet. It was all just a jumble of stuff I'd tossed in my cart at the grocery store. If I still shopped, that is. Allison shops for me now, and has done for the last decade. She has a tremendous crush on me, Allison. Used to, at least. It's a playful thing between us now. One of our little games makes me feel good. Who doesn't like feeling good? Actually, I'm not sure Allison does. But she's not normal. She is young and beautiful, and I am old and rich. We get on like a brand new doorknob and an old skeleton key. Well, that's something I wrote down, about us. Almost something. One of my attempts. I'm the old key, if you wondered. The interesting thing is that a lot of the things I write are promising and not at the same time. I find that confusing, sort of good and bad simultaneously. Frustrating evidence is what it is. But I'm rich in a silly way, rich in a lost way, almost rich in a poor way, if that can be said. And Allison is unhappy in a happy way, if that can be said. She's not depressed. She's just sort of joyfully semi-existential. She's not a fan of the whole wide world. She's moved a bit beyond care, I suppose is what I mean. Not given up. She's just over it, which seems to make her happy in an unhappy way. A car pulls up behind mine. Ours, I suppose. Allison, who is also my chauffeur, hasn't noticed, pinging away at her phone. Or she has noticed and is texting me about it. My phone bumbles on the shelf. Weird twin car, her text arrives. Because the cars are identical. Black 7000 series. Mini luxury limousines for the ultra-wealthy, who want to be ultra-discreet, like me. Yet which ultra-discretion they, I, definitely want duly noted by those who can so duly note, I so duly note, and hope whoever is in the car might so duly note back. Perhaps we might nod to one another. I've been longing to slide my finger along my nose, secret society style. A gentleman's gentleman steps out of the car, cabin door, curbside, unassisted, which is interesting. Buttons his coat. A John Adams manquette, I think it's called. A three-quarter length Oxford jacket. 
but don't you dare call it a jacket. It drapes to his knees with a slow silk ease, like it's made of black cave wind. You bet I write that down. Made of black cave wind. The gentleman runs a hand through a puff of gray hair and flattens it down and dark, like it's not hair, but a kind of wet clay. Wet clay hair, I write. He's heavily featured and sharp, very carved and cut out. Ugly, handsome, Allison would say. That's what she says of me. A sort of wild car wreck of a face, I apparently have, but hard not to look at. And once you get over it, you get used to it. And once you get used to it, it's rather wretchedly handsome. I'll take it, even if it requires a near-death voyage to the moon and back to earn it. The man glances up the road and then orbits and then heads down the alley. Beneath the polishing fall of his cave wind clothes, his shoulders, knees, elbows, and ankles show themselves, like sharp discrepancies that poke out as he strolls down the alley toward the little man and his puddle. I call the little strong man K in my notebook. I always call potential henchmen K. I don't have a name yet for the clay-haired man, but I am thinking of him now as my nemesis for my novel and possibly my life, a kind of doppelganger who dresses in black cave winds, evil me. Kay has stopped his puddle game and slips on shiny black gloves as Bartholomew Q. Endicott, as I've suddenly, boldly, badly named my nemesis, continues to elbow an ankle along. He really should wear stiffer clothes, wool perhaps, a tarp. The black cave winds give his pointy ends too much countenance. Is that the right word? K now, somehow, has a face. Maybe because he's still at the arrival of Bartholomew Q. Endicott, the light has begun to collect around his faint features, and a squishy, froggy face resolves. Allison has a set of binoculars in the car, and I consider texting her. She could dance them out to me in fifteen seconds. She's exceedingly swift because I now have an enormous desire to see the small goings-on between these two men, boss and henchman. If Allison were looking at me now, I'd mouth the words, binoculars, but she's still chipping at her phone. I'll survive without a close-up. Seeing the specifics would probably be a letdown. I want to find the beginnings of a novel, a hook for my book, a way to start it. And maybe not seeing exactly what they're doing will help me and my so-called imagination, if I have one. A text vibrates in from Allison. You watching this? I look up at her. She's looking at me now. If I was twenty years younger, ten even? I nod. She nods. And then she gently draws our seven thousand back toward the twin seven thousand parked directly behind her to give me an absolutely clear view of the alley scene for my novel. The driver of the twin car opens his window and thrusts an arm out to protest the narrowing space. I see a gold Waco watch on his wrist. That's a $20,000 watch on the wrist of a chauffeur. A gift? Or perhaps the driver is more like an associate of Bartholomew Z. Quinge. I've just changed his name because of that gold watch, and because I find myself cringing as Allison gently bumps our 7000 series into their 7000 series. The driver-slash-associate opens his door, hoists trousers over belly, and begins ticking the buttons on his jacket. A little zippery move. I think of body bags. I think he's good at them. Allison opens her window now. Copper hair rushes the breeze and dandles, fetchingly, doorside. Her Rapunzel tactic. She has mesmerizing hair. She has wiles. Men are idiots, is the sort of thing she is constantly, silently saying. This Rapunzeling, to give the approaching driver slash associate with the golden watch and body bag skills a chance to figure out how he wants to finesse this coming moment with someone with hair like that. Get the blood flowing away from his brain, anyway. But now I've missed a moment or two in the alley. Bart Z is still approaching K at the puddle, and they're talking now. K has statued. His eyes have fixed. Bart extends a hand. K reaches out to shake it. No. Kiss it. 
Wow, no, not kiss it. More like Kay has set his forehead on the back of Bart's bare hand. Am I seeing that right? I'm imagining heavy old rings on long gray fingers. I'm imagining asking Allison if we might try such a thing. While ceremonial in style, it's perfunctory, like these men meet often in alleys, and this ritual is just something they've agreed to move through quickly. Necessary, but let's not make a show of it. Bartzi's hands come into a clasp behind his back. Kay stares at the ground, cocking an ear to listen. Kay nods once. Bart's hands break apart and then glide forward enough to permit a half-gesture of uncertainty before closing together again. A sophisticated shrug is what it is, an art gallery wonder. I like it, but what does it mean? Or, for our boss and henchmen doing dark things in the alleyway purposes, it's as though Bart is saying, Is this something you can handle? Case is one word. That's it. Fires it with half a breath, a gunshot response. It doesn't look like yes, or yeah, or no, or okay. Possibly just K. Wouldn't that be a sweet trick, if I'd named him K, and K was the only thing he ever said? I like that a lot. I wrote it down. A henchman named K, who only ever says K. We need to get to the bottom of this K, Bartholomew Z. Quinge said in the alley with the permanent puddle. Is that something you can handle? K, says K. And Kay is suddenly off, and I stop writing. He's field-stepping toward the far end of the alley, toward the green expanse of Parkway beyond. And Bart Z is milling back, casual, after-dinner style, hands still cuffed behind him, a philosophical, surrendering, contemplative pose. Art gallery again, I think. That's two art gallery vibrations from my nemesis. Allison looks at me with some alarm her brows raised in fear or excitement. In a moment, she'll probably text, What next? The driver slash associate has gone around to the far side of our car, perhaps looking for damage. I'm writing, I mouth. She hates when I mouth. But she understands me perfectly. She texts me back, What? You understand me perfectly, I mouth. Actually, I don't just mouth, because I'm not very good at it. I actually have to say things out loud in order to mouth them, which Allison knows and which she dislikes and finds embarrassing on my behalf. It's a little argument we have. Stop writing. He's coming. This isn't good. Get out here. She texts. She's been pushing for action all week. She doesn't exactly say it, but she doesn't think I have the bollocks for a novel. Her word. I don't quite understand what she means, but it hurts. Yes, I can observe well and record my observations and can write a rickety sentence or two, etc., etc., but that's it. Who can't? Her idea is that we have to find someone interesting and follow them. For days. Weeks. The only way I'll ever be able to write a novel is if I see a novel unfold before my very eyes. Well, that's not a novel, I say. It's the only kind of novel you'll ever write she says. Z steps into the passenger side of his 7,000. Interesting. I sometimes ride up front with Allison, but usually because I've brought snacks or coffee. She doesn't like it. She likes looking at me in the rear view. She thinks we find each other more alluring that way, seeing each other in a little wedge of mirror. Or she just likes being alone. The twin 7,000 pulls out and slings down the road. But I see why Z chose to sit in the front seat. In the back window, a shadowy form materializes. Then a face presses to the tinted glass. Pale palms on either side like a horror movie. The mouth articulating. It's a flash, a photograph. I'm not really looking, just registering a departure. But when I glance back to mouth a question to Allison, she's gone. Her window is open, empty. She's not there. I wait a moment, stare, wait for her to stand on the far side of the car or sit up, or suddenly be standing beside me in the crystal ball cafe. Nothing. Kay disappears at the end of the alley, crossing into the parkway. I shove against the Palace of Swords painting to get a glimpse of the 7,000, if I can. Gone. I close my eyes and replay the sequence. 
Probably the reason I thought I could be a novelist. It's a parlor trick, not a skill, unless I turn out to be a novelist and use it in my novels. But I can recall conversations nearly verbatim. I mean nearly, and not exactly verbatim. And while I don't have a photographic memory, I have, well, I don't know what to call it, semi-reconstructive vision. Good visual recall is what Allison calls it. I cannot convince her of my talents here. Good or great, I'll say. Good, she says, above average. She worries I'll get an inflated sense of myself, perhaps. Perhaps because I already have an inflated sense of myself. But I want an inflated sense of myself. That's the whole point, I like to say. But I can see things pretty well after the fact, pretty clearly. I will, for example, probably look around the Crystal Ball Cafe this evening in my head if I want to write a bit more about Bard and Kay and I. Look a little closer at the various tarot card paintings on the wall for analogies to whatever seems at the moment to be transpiring. I absorb is probably the best way to put it. I watch the car pull away in my head and then again watch the face and hands pressed to the dark window. It's Allison, her lips mouthing two words. Follow Kay.